Um, but, you know, not as, I mean, for patients with bladder cancer or prostate cancer, I believe they're, they're very eager. Very eager. Okay. That's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. All right. So if you don't um, mind, Dr. Himes, we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to our Empire Series again. We're very lucky uh, to have a back-to-back -back, uh, day of Columbia faculty um, um, continuing on our testicular cancer talk from yesterday and then talking about prostate cancer today. Um, so Dr. Himes is uh, one of our associate professors of urology at uh, Columbia. He uh, did his training at NYU uh, fellowship at uh, Hopkins and initially uh, worked at Dartmouth and came to us um, focusing a lot on minimally invasive surgery. Um, Dr. Himes, before we get started, I just wanted to ask you kind of regarding your path to this point, what interested you in minimally invasive surgery, uh, the robotics and laparoscopic, kind of what, what kind of led you here? Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the short answer is, is mentorship, you know, so in residency, you know, I identified mentors who I liked working with, who, you know, I wanted to work clinically with and do research with. And um, I was pretty undifferentiated going in, like I didn't was fairly open to anything. But, um, you know, I, I mean, certainly the, the procedures themselves, you know, you gravitate toward based on your, your interests and sort of what, what appeals to you, what you feel that you're, you are good at, that sort of thing that just coalesces. But um, I think the main thing is really mentorship. And because you spend time, uh, you know, working with people and you want to have fun. So, you know, you find the people you like to work with and you do that and things just build momentum. And, you know, it led to, for me, an endourology fellowship, minimally invasive fellowship at Hopkins, which, you know, at the time was sort of a more traditional endo fellowship where um, it ended up being about two thirds robotics and laparoscopy, about a third um, of PCNL and stones, that sort of thing, which was a good breakdown for me. You know, those were the two things I was interested in um, coming out of residency. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I found fellowship directors I really like to work with and, and went from there. Then, you know, just over time, you, again, you figure out what you, what you like more and you just, you, you see what the job market looks like and where you want to live. And sometimes these things are out of your hands a little bit. I mean, you can only control your destiny just so much, but, um, you know, there was a job at Dartmouth focusing on, on, on prostate cancer, um, basically taking over the, um, you know, prostate cancer, you know, franchise from um, a, a gentleman, John Heaney, who was retiring. And I wanted to be in New England. So, so that worked out. And so we spent a lot of time doing, you know, robotic prostatectomy and, and working in that diag diagnosis and, of, and counseling of men for prostate cancer and that sort of thing. Um, so, it's interesting, you know, when I, I don't know how much time we want to just dwell on this, but I, I think, I think that it's, it's probably more important than the talk, to be honest, just having like a career counseling thing. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have to be open-minded. So, you, you know, I went there and um, sort of did that for a while. And then, you know, really a lot of good opportunities there, but you know, we really wanted to move from that setting with Dartmouth where it was sort of, much more rural and quiet. And we wanted to come, my wife and I wanted to come back to the city and sort of area and raise our children around here. Um, so, you know, there are sort of lifestyle things that drive you from point A to point B as well. So it, it's you know, lots of different things, you know, can affect your decision making. Um, but, um, you know, I think one I th principle I think that's important is to try to maximize the number of options that are available to you. Try not to get too narrow too early um, because you don't know sort of what directions you may go and you may um, not meet a mentor who will really inspire you if you're too narrow too early. Yeah. Yeah, no, I always, um, the one thing I find it fascinating also to think about is in terms of professional growth in academic medicine, when people decide to go from one institution to another because they're trying to go up this ladder um, and when when that decision comes to place, was that at all a factor or was it was kind of the location and then you would see what would happen if, because you knew New York City had the opportunities to provide that academic growth as well? Sure. I, it was both of those things. I think the, the primary driver was lifestyle, to be honest. Um, but, you know, a, a, in second place was was professional opportunity. You know, I mean, 
Dartmouth's outstanding. There are tons of academic opportunities there. It's just, you know, um, you know, Columbia has, has more resources, you know, for research. They have, um, you know, financial resources. They have manpower, you know. They have, you know, support, analytical support for research and things like that. Um, so, you know, you, you factor that in. And, you know, it's true. I was at a point where I, I wanted to avail myself of those resources. So, um, but that wasn't, that wasn't the singular driver. Exactly. Ironically, you know, when I finished residency at NYU, I vowed never to practice in the New York metro area because of the, the sort of the density of the competition and, and all of that. And, um, and it brought you right back. I, saw, I saw my mentors being frustrated by patients seeking their 10th opinion for their prostate, prostate cancer. Um, and poetic injustice, here I am, you know, in, in, in the fray. But, uh, you know, it, there are opportunities and, and challenges with it. So. Um, Nothing's perfect. Sure. No, well, we're really lucky to have you. Um, not only at our, you know, at Columbia. I can. I know. I speak on behalf of all the residents, but also very. Thank you for being a part of this series. I'll kind of turn it over to you so we can get started on your talk, and we'll leave a few minutes at the end for any questions that anyone has. Um, please just post them on the chat. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Himes. Thanks, Bian. So this talk is entitled "Counseling Patients on Treatment of Localized Prostate Cancer (RCTs)," and I thought you know, because this is a, a lecture series geared toward residents, that it would be helpful um, and interesting to um, go over the sort of the landmark RCTs that um, explored, you know, how to treat men for localized prostate cancer. Um, this is maybe a review for many of you and maybe an introduction for some of you, but you know, this, these are subjects that are, are very pertinent to, you know, our daily work as urologists, uh, diagnosing and counseling men with prostate cancer. And also, some of this comes up on, on exams, um, so that may be helpful in that regard as well. So I have no disclosures. So the overview of this talk is that we'll, we'll start by reviewing landmark trials uh, that have been published over the last you know, decade or more um, for treatment of clinically localized prostate cancer. These include the SPCG4 trial or the Scandinavian trial, the PIVOT trial, and the PROTECT trial. We'll also um, review quality of life outcomes associated with these trials. These trials published oncological outcomes, but in parallel or subsequently um, published um, sort of the, the sort of side effect profile of the different um, treatments. Um, and all of this kind of comes together when you're counseling men about what to do for their prostate cancer. So in conclusion, we'll try to synthesize the evidence to help us think about how we might counsel men with localized prostate cancer in an evidence-based way. So, I mean, this is obvious, but there are different ways of treating localized prostate cancer, surgery, radiation therapy, different types of ablative therapies, and different types of expectant management with watchful waiting or active surveillance. And all of these are often part of the discussion, or at least the thought process, uh, when counseling men who are newly diagnosed. We're going to focus on um, the SPCG4 trial and PIVOT trials, which compared surgery with watchful waiting and the PROTECT trial, which compared surgery, radiation therapy, and active monitoring. So it's important as we go through these to appreciate the historical context of these trials. You know, there over the last, again, decade or more, actually a couple of decades, there have been really significant changes in screening, biopsy, and treatment approaches um, so that, you know, we'll have to think about the generalizability of the findings in these trials, but um, this is really a ne of necessity um, that, you know, these have this historical context because when you talk about localized prostate cancer, it really takes a long time to affect mortality, so you need long follow-up. And, and the, the challenge is that by the time the data mature, your treatments are pseudo-obsolete. They're not totally obsolete, and there are a number of important lessons to glean from these trials for contemporary patients. But we have to think about this inherent limitation of these studies, but not be nihilistic about it. So the first study we'll talk about is the SPCG4 Scandinavian trial, and this is the most recent report from that trial with 29-year follow-up. So here, 695 men with localized prostate cancer were randomized to uh, a radical prostatectomy or watchful waiting. This occurred at 14 centers in Sweden, Finland, and Iceland between 1989 and 1999. Inclusion criteria included men uh, under the age of 75 with a life expectancy estimated over 10 years a BSA less than 50 and localized tumor um, defined as a negative bone skin. They used sort of an old sort of scheme um, as well, uh, requiring highly to moderately highly differentiated cancer according to the WHO classification. 
Uh, as with all good trials of this nature, they had an independent cause of death committee and centralized pathology. So here's the flow diagram for the, the trial. It shows that ultimately 347 patients were analyzed um, based on intention to treat with radical prostatectomy and 348 with watchful waiting. And the, the, about 85% of, of, of patients assigned to one or the other arm actually underwent that treatment. Um, so there was um, some divergence, but and that, that's important to know, but about 85% had treatment adherence. So men were followed with exams every six months for two years then annually, and the endpoints were metastasis defined as a positive bone scan or histologically confirmed metastasis. A local recurrence in prostatectomy patients defined as a palpable mass on DRE or something histologically confirmed. Progression in watchful waiting patients defined as a palpable a mass or avoiding malignant voiding obstruction requiring an intervention, as well as overall in prostate cancer mortality. And all participants were followed until the end of 2017. There were no patients lost to follow up. ADT was started for men if they developed a local recurrence, uh, if they had undergone a uh, radical prostatectomy, if they developed metastasis in either group. And starting in 2003, ADT was um, considered if men had a rising PSA tumor progression or this was deemed to have a clinical benefit. This table shows the clinical characteristics of patients assigned to radical prostatectomy and watchful waiting. It was a randomized trial, so there was um, sort of um, equivalence of, of, of these um, patient and disease characteristics. The age of men was approximately 65 in both arms. The mean PSA was a little bit high, higher than it is in the present contemporary setting. For the man who's diagnosed, typically it was uh, around 13. And the reason for this is that, you know, very few of these men were screen detected. Um, only about 12% um, were de detected by PSA only. Most men had a clinical diagnosis based on symptoms. Only 5% had a diagnosis based on, on screening. And you can see in the middle the breakdown of Gleason scores. About 47% of men had Gleason 5 or 6 prostate cancer, 22% Gleason 7, and only 4% Gleason 8 or 9. So it seems like perhaps, you know, there, there are some lower risk men in here, but it's important to think historically, most of these men had a um, limited number of biopsies, overwhelmingly fewer than six or fewer cores. So there was likely some underdiagnosis um, histopathologically. And you can sort of appreciate um, the fact that these were clinically diagnosed men and with their PSA, that, that there were higher risk than what we may see um, in the contemporary screening setting. So this table um, shows the sort of the outcomes um, for prostatectomy and watchful waiting patients um, in comparison. So about 72% of men um, who, who were assigned to radical prostatectomy had overall mortality versus 84% uh, overall mortality and watchful waiting. So the absolute difference was 12 percentage points um, reduction in with radical prostatectomy. The relative risk of, of, of overall mortality was 0.74, and the number needed to treat to prevent one death with prostatectomy was 8.4. And there was a, a greater benefit for men who were younger. So for men less than 65, um, as you can see here, the, uh, there was a 15% reduction versus 10% risk reduction overall. Uh, for men greater than 65 with a, a lower relative risk and a, and a lower number of men needed to treat to save one life. Um, similarly, death from prostate cancer uh, occurred in 19.6% uh, of prostatectomy patients versus 31% of watchful waiting patients. So overall, uh, the, the risk difference or absolute risk reduction was 11.7%, a relative risk of 0.55, and number needed to treat of 8.6 with surgery to avoid one death from prostate cancer. Um, Similarly, there was greater benefit in younger men. And then for distant metastasis, this occurred in 26.6% of prostatectomy patients versus 43.3% of watchful waiting patients for an absolute difference of around 17 percentage points. And six men needed to be treated with surgery to avoid one case of metastasis. And all of these were significant differences. There was also this um, sort of uh, an examination of younger versus older men, a greater benefit for younger men. This table shows um, the um, sort of predictors of distant metastasis and death from prostate cancer in men who underwent surgery. Um, and the, in, in this table, it shows that positive surgical margins actually were not independently predictive of distant metastasis in, in the sort of the full um, sort of multivariable model. Um, it did not predict metastasis. However, extracapsular extension and higher Gleason score did. 
Um, in terms of predictors of death from prostate cancer, similarly and interestingly, positive surgical margins were not an independent predictor. However, extra capsular extension was um, and higher Gleason score was as well. Notably, uh, men with 3 plus 4 equals 7 cancer or grade group 2 cancer, that, that finding that Gleason score was not an independent predictor of death from prostate cancer um, compared to 4 plus 3 or greater. Um, and I think this is sort of instructive and this, this sort of informs a little bit how we counsel men um, who undergo radical prostatectomy. Um, you know, we really look at, uh, you know, a, all of the, the pathological findings um, and we really don't get um, necessarily too nervous about three plus four disease or a positive surgical margin in the absence of other adverse pathological features. So they did both an intention to treat analysis and then they also did a per protocol analysis or an analysis by treatment received, um, which is a little bit different. Um, the first avoids some bias um, and, and the second is sort of more focus on what men actually undergo, and there was no difference, and this sort of strengthened their, their, their findings. Uh, they found that surgery was associated with a mean of 2.9 uh, years of life gained. This is an average, obviously, with a wide range, but that was the average they reported. And again, this was the most recent report from the SPCG4 trial, so they found that um, actually the benefit of surgery had increased over time by more than a factor of two between the report at 10 years and 23 years um, with a, a greater benefit in terms of overall mortality and prostate cancer mortality with longer follow-up. And the lesson here is that longer follow-up for um, you know, these patients um, can potentially uh, demonstrate greater benefit of an intervention based on the long lead time for these outcomes for, for localized prostate cancer. So in summary, uh, prostatectomy was associated with a lower risk of overall mortality, prostate cancer mortality, and metastatic disease compared with watchful waiting with a greater benefit in men who are younger. Strengths of this study were completeness of very long-term follow-up, which is quite unique, blinded evaluation of causes of death, and the agreement of the uh, per protocol and attention to treat analysis. Limitations, as mentioned earlier, are generalizability to contemporary patients. These are clinically, primarily clinically diagnosed men rather than screen-detected men who we see more in the, in the contemporary era. The control group was a little bit of a straw man, so we don't do watchful waiting as much for these men um, unless they're sort of older. Um, and so, you know, active surveillance really has, has replaced watchful waiting as the alternative standard of care for, for, for some of these men with, with uh, um, newly diagnosed cancer. And there was there were essentially no men with, of African descent, so we can't really generalize from this to men with extra risk factors, additional risk factors like uh, that ethnicity. This is a uh, figure from one of the earlier reports from the trial, which I, I think is, is useful. We talk a lot about mortality. I think it's really important to talk also about prevention of metastatic disease and, it, and uh, the need for ADT when we talk about the benefits of these interventions. And it, it just basically shows that for men who undergo radical prostatectomy, there's a, a lower likelihood of developing metastasis or needing ADT um, compared to watchful waiting patients. And that's true overall and for the different subgroups. So the next study we'll talk about is the PIVOT trial. This occurred primarily at, in veterans hospitals in the U.S., and there were 731 men with localized cancer who were randomized to surgery or watchful waiting between 1994 and 2002, and these men were primarily screen detected. Um, inclusion criteria included medical fitness for prostatectomy, uh, histologic confirmed diagnosis within 12 months, uh, PSA less than 50, age less than 75, negative bone scan and life expectancy estimated at 10 years or more. So sort of similar in that way to the, the Scandinavian trial. There was also central pathology review. And follow-up, um, men had uh, visits every six months for a minimum of eight years. They had bone scans at five-year intervals. And the outcomes that they analyzed, the primary outcome was all-cause mortality. Then their secondary outcome was prostate cancer-specific mortality. And they performed an intention to treat analysis. So th this is an important point. They intended originally to enroll 2,000 men, but they had difficulties recruiting that number of men. So they had to revise their um, the goal for enrollment to 740 men, and they did a power calculation for that. Uh, but one, criti one criticism of the pivot trial has been sort of underpowering to detect a difference. So here's the, the flow diagram, and about 80% of men who were assigned to prostatectomy or observation actually had, had adherence to that assignment, and others were um, sort of diverged, as stated here. So the mean age was 67, so a little bit older. A third of men were African-American, different demographically from the prior trial. 
the median PSA was 7.8, which certainly lower than the, the prior trial. Half of men were uh, clinical stage T1C, and the breakdown of D'Amico risk was uh, shown here, 40% low risk, 34% intermediate, 21% high risk, and 48% of men had Gleason 7 or greater disease. These Kaplan-Meier curves show on the top death for any cause um, and on the, on the bottom death from prostate cancer, and there were no significant differences in overall or prostate cancer mortality between the two arms at 10-year follow-up. Overall mortality occurred in 47% of surgery patients and 49.9% of observation patients with an insignificant risk reduction. For prostate cancer mortality, that occurred in 5.8% of surgery patients and 8.4% of observation patients. Again, a not, a, not a significant difference. It's important to note that more than 40% of patients had non-prostate cancer-related death by 10 years uh, after randomization, so there was a, a high level of competing risk in these patients. So these were really sicker men who were, were um, sort of enrolled in the trial with 4 out of 10 dying not from prostate cancer in, within 10 years. So this, this forest plot shows that um, there's some, the suggestion of some subgroup differences for, for men with a, with a higher PSA, greater than 10, surgery reduced all-cause mortality by 13%, um, which was uh, significant. Um, and for intermediate risk disease, uh, RP reduced all-cause mortality by similarly around 13%. When looking at prostate cancer mortality, there were also some differences by subgroups for men with higher PSA, uh, greater than 10. Surgery reduced prostate cancer mortality by 7%, and for high-risk cancer, it reduced, it reduced um, prostate cancer mortality by 8%, and, and these were, were um, significant. So the authors don't really linger on this point, but there was actually lower risk of metastasis in surgical patients versus observation patients, 4.7 versus 10.6. This difference was not present for men with lower risk disease, but for men with PSAs greater than 10 or intermediate or high risk disease, there was a nine to 11% redu overall reduction or absolute reduction in the incidence of metastasis, which I think is, is significant. Um, and this table shows the adverse outcomes associated with surgery. About 21% of men had some adverse outcome. And you can see the distribution here with, with things we usually uh, think about like wound infection, UTI, et cetera. So in summary, in the PIVOT trial, surgery did not decrease all-cause or prostate cancer mortality versus observation among men with clinically localized, primarily screen-detected prostate cancers. Low subgroups suggested a benefit for men with higher PSAs and higher risk disease. There was a redu reduction in bone metastasis. And notably, these were mostly uh, slightly older and comorbid patients. Only 10% of men were younger than 60, and there was a high level of competing risk. And so... The takeaway here is that um, that you know the pivot trial uh, is useful. It does show that for um, for this type for men who are a little bit older and a little bit sicker, there may be a limited benefit to to intervention. And it does, I think, support observation for localized prostate cancer in men with lower risk cancer who actually ha also have competing risks of mortality. So this was a uh, follow-up study for the PIVOT, sort of an extended follow-up study um, that assessed all-cause mortality through a later time point, January 2017. They were not able, unfortunately, to assess prostate cancer mortality due to limited access to medical records, but it showed through more extended follow-up, a median of 18.6 years, um, there was no significant difference in overall mortality between uh, surgery and observation. 68% uh, versus 73% with an insignificant difference. They did show that there was um, um, some slightly increased uh, reduction in mortality over time um, from 4% at five years to 5.7% at 22 years, but, but these um, uh, were, were not significant differences statistically. So this table um, shows um, by patient and uh, tumor subgroups all-cause mortality um, for surgery and, and observation patients. And there was a suggestion of some difference uh, for men with intermediate risk cancer, and actually Gleason scores less than seven. Um, however, in the full statistical model that they ran, um, sort of more rigorously looking at differences between subgroups, there was, there was no uh, effective surgery on mortality by patient or tumor characteristics uh, with the P for interaction greater than 0.1. They looked at mean life years gained from surgery versus uh, observation. They showed no benefit for overall and for all um, patient and tumor subgroups, though there was some increased uh, gain in life years for men with intermediate risk disease. And that's shown here in the far right column in the blue box. You see years of life gained 
um, by a subgroup overall and by subgroup overall, there was only one life year potentially gained, um, which was not significant though uh, for men with higher PSAs and intermediate risk cancer, um, that potential benefit was a little bit greater. This forest plot shows um, that for some subgroups, there was a suggestion of a benefit um, for surgery over radiation for all cause mortality for higher PSA, intermediate risk cancer, Gleason less than seven and higher percent course positive. But again, in their full statistical model, which they ran um, to really look at these subgroups in a more rigorous way, there was no significant difference in all cause mortality by subgroups. So these figures show that there, there, there is some separation of the curves between surgery and radiation um, based on risk. So for CAPRA risk, um, you know, you can see for intermediate and high risk cancer, there's greater separation of all cause mortality, um, you know, with some potential benefit for surgery over time. This was significant only um, in terms of the hazard ratio for, um, for intermediate risk cancer. And you can see here some separation of the curves for based on uh, percent core positivity. So for a greater, you know, burden of disease, um, there was, you know, potential greater benefit for, um, for surgery over radiation therapy. So in summary, um, at 21 years of follow-up, the PIVOTS trial shows, um, you know, a relative risk reduction of 8%, an absolute risk reduction of 5%, and a median survival increase of one year. Um, uh, which, which they did not deem to be significant. Um, results did not vary by tumor or patient characteristics in their statistical model. However, there, there seemed to be greater effects of surgery and a potential greater benefit of surgery if men had intermediate risk disease or a higher percentage of positive cores. The number needed to treat to prevent one death at uh, 22 years was 18 for the overall cohort and, and greater than eight for all subgroups. And um, you know, for men with lower risk disease, you really have to treat a lot of men to see a potential benefit. Um, and notably more than 70% of men died from mostly other causes by the end of follow-up. Um, so again, one limitation of the study is the lack of power. And you can see a suggestion of some maybe separation of the Kaplan-Meier curves um, that don't reach statistical significance. And the fact that this was underpowered suggests that perhaps with further powering, there may have been a, a greater difference that could be demonstrated. Um, so another, another critique, I won't say criticism, but critique of the pivot trial, as I mentioned, was the fact that there was a high level of competing risks in the men who were enrolled. Um, so these authors wanted to explore that a little bit more. Um, and so they evaluated over 4,000 men undergoing prostatectomy at their institution from 1992 to 2010. And they really wanted to see which subgroups of their surgically treated patients harbored a competing mortality risk that was comparable to the pivot trial. And they found that only a very small percentage had similar levels of competing risk. And in fact, among their patients, um, uh, a competing mortality risk equivalent to the pivot trial wasn't reached until men had an age-adjusted Charleston score of five, which correspond to a man in his 70s with diabetes and end organ damage. And only not, about 9% of the patients who they treated surgically belonged in this high-risk subgroup. So their, their conclusion was that the pivot trial should be used with caution to exclude candidates with comorbidities from curative treatment. And in fact, you know, not uncommonly, people use the pivot trial to justify not treating men who are a little bit older and may have more comorbidities. And this study suggests that we should be cautious doing so. The next study to go through is the, um, the PROTECT trial. So this study compared surgery, radi radiation therapy, and active monitoring for screen-detected prostate cancer. This was done in the UK. And from 1999 to 2009, this is how this study started. There was a, a screening study, and over 82,000 men between the age of 50 and 69 were screened. 2,664 were diagnosed with, with localized prostate cancer, and 1643 agreed to randomization. And in this study, they compared prostate cancer and all-cause mortality, metastasis, and disease progression at 10 years. Here's a flow diagram showing um, that treatment adherence was a little bit less than for the other trials. Um, 70 to 80 to 88% of men um, proceeded um, based on assignment, but this was done initially as an intention to treat study. So for active monitoring, this was not active surveillance. Uh, this was more than watchful waiting though. And so men were followed with PSA every three months for a year and then every six to 12 months thereafter. And, and their case was reviews, reviewed 
and treatment was considered if they had a PSA increase of at least 50% from the prior, during the prior 12 months. For radiation therapy, men had neoadjuvant ADT for three to six months and then 3D CRT at 74 gray and 37 fractions, standard of care at the time, and cases were reviewed for biochemical recurrence or concerns for progression. And then with surgery were, were followed with PSA thereafter. And adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy were considered for men with adverse pathology or biochemical recurrence. ADT was offered for um, a very high PSA or if otherwise indicated. So the primary endpoint was prostate cancer mortality and secondary endpoints were all-cause mortality, and metastasis, clinical progression, et cetera. Metastasis could occur in bones, viscera, or lymph nodes, or, and it was also defined as PSA greater than 100. Clinical progression was broadly defined as metastasis, clinical stage T3 or 4 disease, the need for ADT, long-term ADT, uh, morbidity like ureteral obstruction or rectal fistula, or need for a catheter due to tumor progression. They had an independent cause of death committee uh, to determine cause of death, and, and this was an intention to treat analysis. So the mean age was 62, so these men were a little bit younger. The median PSA was 4.6, so cancer was a little bit less risky. 77% had Gleason 6 disease. 76% had clinical stage T1C disease, and you can see this in, in contrast to the prior studies. This, study, this uh, figure shows uh, the cumulative probability of a, of a definitive treatment with surgery or radiation. You can see more than 80% of men um, assigned to treatment under, un, end up undergoing treatment. But by 10 years of follow-up, um, more than half of the men in the active monitoring group um, did move to treatment. Um, so this was not sort of um, fixed in active treatment, and, and there was um, sort of conversion from monitoring to treatment over time, typically based on, on disease progression. So of, of men undergoing RP, about 2% had um, primary treatment failure and required radiation or hormone therapy. Nine patients underwent uh, adjuvant RT for adverse pathology. Of the men undergoing radiotherapy, 18% had treatment failure, three had salvage uh, prostatectomy, and 14 had long-term ADT, one had salvage HIFU. This um, table compares outcomes for uh, the three treatment arms. There was no difference at 10 years for prostate cancer uh, mortality, um, about 1% uh, prostate cancer mortality at, at 10 years for all groups, which was not significant, so a very low risk of death from prostate cancer. Not surprising given the low risk uh, kind of characteristics of the patients uh, who were, were, um, were, were assigned. There was though a significant difference in clinical progression with a greater risk of clinical progression in monitoring versus uh, surgery radiation therapy and a greater risk of metastasis in monitoring patients versus treatment patients. There was also no difference in over, or overall or all cause mortality at 10 years. Uh, these curves show um, graphically that there was you know, no difference in prostate cancer survival between groups with excellent 99% um, um, long-term um, or no, mid-term 10-year prostate cancer survival. Though in terms of freedom from disease progression, you can see from the, um, the, the dashed line in green, which is active monitoring, that there was greater risk of disease progression with monitoring. As mentioned, there were very few deaths from prostate cancer, and so you know, not surprisingly, there was no difference between subgroups in terms of death from prostate cancer. 204 men had disease progression, 20% uh, of active monitoring patients versus about 8% of uh, prostatectomy radiotherapy patients. You can see here the breakdown. There was greater risk of metastasis, clinical stage T3 or 4 disease, and the need for long-term ADT in monitored patients. Treatment complications are, you know, as you would expect for RP, there was some thromboembola complications, some transfusions, one rectal injury. For radiation therapy, uh, there were three unrelated deaths um, within 90 days. So they calculated the number needed to treat to avoid one case of metastatic disease, and it was 27 men needed surgery or 33 men needed radiation therapy to avoid one case of metastasis, and nine men needed to be treated in some definitive way to avoid one case of clinical progression. So in summary, at a median follow-up of 10 years, there was very low um, mortality from prostate cancer at 1%, regardless of the assigned treatment. RP and RT uh, were associated with lower rates of metastasis and progression, despite a 50% crossover in monitored patients. The benefit of monitoring, though there was a, a, some slight increased risk of, of cancer progression, um, the benefit was that 44% of men didn't receive a radical treatment, which was good in that they avoided the side effects of those treatments. So those needed to be balanced. And their conclusion was that for, for these lower risk men, active monitoring um, it can, might be, can, may be considered safe in terms of um, a no increased risk of 
prostate cancer death, though you need to um, kind of consider the risk of disease progression over time. So limitations, again, this active monitoring arm is not active surveillance, so it's not as rigorous as how we follow men presently. Very few men were of African ancestry, and this was a 10-year follow-up for lower-risk men, and, and I think it's um, uh, reasonable to say that this is not long enough to evaluate a potential survival difference if, if it did exist. And finally, these are lower-risk men who are, are not as often considered for definitive therapy presently, and so we need to be careful generalizing from, from this study to, um, you know, to the men who we are considering for treatment and, and presently. So this, um, this follow-up study for PROTECT um, redid the study not as an intention to treat analysis, um, but rather as an analysis by treatment received. These are the intention to treat analysis, um, which sticks with randomization, you know, strives to give unbiased estimates of the differences between the treatments, but can underestimate differences due to compliance or crossover. So they did the analysis by treatment received, which can be more useful for men sort of examining treatment A versus treatment B and what the consequences may be for them. But the downside of this type of analysis is that there can be confounded by indication and men who have um, radical treatment um, typically have worse disease and different baseline characteristics. So they compared outcomes um, uh, based on treatment received uh, among both those who were randomized in the study and those actually in the, in, in the study um, who declined randomization, and they did a propensity score analysis to control for confounding. And basically, the, the um, outcomes were the same. There was no, no significant increase in prostate cancer mortality with, with active monitoring. Um, there was a slight suggestion of, of, of a decrease in prostate cancer mortality among treated patients in some exploratory analysis but the number of deaths was so low that they didn't deem this to be significant. And there continued to be evidence, which they considered strong evidence that um, treatment um, decreased the risk of metastasis and disease progression compared with monitoring. So this is, these tables just demonstrate those, um, those findings showing a lower risk of, of um, well, I guess in this table, a higher risk of um, metastasis progression and hormone therapy with monitored patients versus treated patients and a lower risk of, or lower hazard ratio for metastasis progression, hormone therapy among treated patients versus monitoring patients. Notably, there were no differences here between radiation therapy and, and surgery, uh, really equivalent uh, risks of disease progression, metastasis, et cetera. So, you know, this is important in, in terms of thinking of types of intervention, and at least this study shows that there is equivalence between the, those types of treatments. So in summary, the PROTECT study, you know, both versions show an insignificant reduction in prostate cancer death at 10 years with some reduction in metastasis and progression. And this, these dual analyses sort of strengthen the conclusions. This study um, examined the issue of the fact that PROTECT patients were lower risk, uh, and they were concerned that people might extrapolate from that to contemporary patients who were considering treatment. And, and they wanted to issue that caveat that contemporary patients they, in their view, had worse have worse disease than patients who are enrolled in the PROTECT trial. Um, in, in some parts of Europe, they, they stated that there's less systematic screening, so there's still clinical detection of cancer and higher risk cancer. And they stipulated that even among screen-detected patients, patients in, you know, in, the, in the current era typically have more aggressive disease than those who um, uh, were enrolled in the PROTECT trial. So to demonstrate this objectively, they looked at the characteristics and competing risks of, of their surgically treated patients at two high volume, actually very high volume institutions. So um, among their surgical cohort, um, more than 20,000 patients or 71% of their, the patients they treated surgically would have been el el eligible for the PROTECT trial with an age between 50 and 69, clinical stage T1 to 2, and a PSA less than 20. So 30% of their treated patients would have been excluded from the PROTECT trial based on uh, worse disease. Um, so they found that in their, their surgically treated cohort, there was increased risk, cancer risk with a higher median PSA and a higher percentage of higher grade group cancer. And they treated fewer low risk patients among those potentially eligible for PROTECT. They also found that over time, there was increasing disease risk within their surgically treated cohort with more sort of contemporary patients have a higher, having a higher percentage of high grade group cancer and high risk disease and there being a lower percentage of low-risk cancers being treated in the more recent era. And this is demonstrated here in these, these um, tables. You can see in the light blue, 
um, the decrease in low risk cancer by grade group and by Tomiko risk category for surgically treated patients, and an increasing proportion of patients with higher risk disease who are being treated. So they looked at competing risks as well between their patients and, and the PROTECT patients. So, and then they looked at their patients, among their patients, among those who were eligible for the PROTECT trial, um, so those were the lower risk patients, the 10 year other cause mortality was actually, it actually exceeded cancer mortality, 7% versus 2%, meaning that uh, these patients had lower risk of cancer, lower risk of death from cancer versus other causes. However, for the third of their patients who were PROTECT ineligible, there was a higher risk of cancer mortality than overall mortality or other cause mortality, 10 versus 7%. So they felt that, you know, this is very important to demonstrate because it's actually that third of patients who may be more representative of patients we treat surgically in the present era. These are men who are more likely to die from prostate cancer, and they're not only better candidates for treatment, but perhaps better candidates to study different types of interventions in. So they concluded, and these, I think the data demonstrate there's been an inverse stage migration toward more aggressive disease treated surgically over time, and that we should be careful in generalizing from the PROTECT trial to contemporary surgical patients uh, who have an increased risk of progression and, and cancer death. So this, this table shows sort of the comparisons between the different trials. I won't belabor the point. We, you know, we sort of have demonstrated these things, but there are really notable differences between the trials and the error in which they occurred, the method of diagnosis, interventions, risk of cancer, competing risks, risk of cancer death, and the outcomes that are shown. So when kind of uh, interpreting and, and comparing these trials, I think there are some, uh, some ideas that are, are worth dwelling on. The first is that these trials show that and, and demonstrate the importance of, of differentiating relative risk and absolute risk reduction. So actually the relative risk reduction for death from prostate cancer was similar across all of these trials, but the absolute risk, the absolute risk reduction differed and actually depended on the baseline risk of death from prostate cancer. So this was highest in the SPCG4 trial, so there, there is actually a, a, the greatest absolute reduction, risk reduction for death from prostate cancer. This was a bit lower in PIVOT, negligible in the PROTECT trial, as men had very low risk to start with. Another important point is that the overall mortality benefit from an intervention is gonna depend on competing risks, which in this study, as shown here, um, varied from trial to trial. Uh, PIVOT patients had the highest con uh, competing risk, Thus, they um, had less of a, an overall mortality benefit compared to SBCG4 and, um, and, the, and PROTECT. Um, and the, this was true both for relative risk reduction of death and absolute risk reduction. So these studies show, particularly SBCG4 shows, that a longer lead time can demonstrate a greater potential benefit for an intervention for localized prostate cancer based on sort of the kind of the gradual time course and gradual natural history of, of that disease. And in SBCG10, from the early reports to the most uh, recent report, the absolute risk reduction for death from prostate cancer increased and uh, the risk reduction from overall mortality increased as well. There was um, a, a greater benefit in terms of preventing metastasis with longer term follow up and the number needed to treat to save one life decreased from 15 to eight, all of which are significant over time. So the lesson here I think is to treat younger men with fewer competing risks if you wanna optimize your benefit. These trials were really underpowered for subgroup analysis, but there's some suggestion that um, some subgroups benefit more from an intervention, for instance, men with longer life expectancy and men with intermediate to high risk disease. It's important to, to briefly kind of um, uh, think about endpoints. So certainly we, you know, these trials are looking at survival, prostate cancer and overall mortality and overall mortality, um, but you know, they also look at metastatic disease freedom from ADT and clinical progression. And these are also really important endpoints, maybe easier to demonstrate and are also clinically significant. And, um, you know, uh, recent trials looking at treatments for advanced disease are using these endpoints and considering them to be clinically significant. And I think that that's important for these types of treatment trials as well. Finally, um, you know, there was, uh, you know, significant other cause mortality in patients who were treated here and, and while inclusion one inclusion criterion for the, the SBCG4 and pivot trials was that there had to be a, an, an assumption that men would be alive 10 years after assignment a lot of men died from other causes so this should I think be a bit sobering in terms of our ability to estimate how long men will live from other causes when we're thinking about you know the potential benefits of treatment so we'll 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 shunt over now to 
a brief discussion of um, quality of life outcomes associated with, with treatment for prostate cancer. Um, really, and this will just be in parallel to the, the trials we, we've discussed um, to this point, all the trials that we've gone through also reported um, quality of life outcomes and side effect profiles of treatment. And this is the other portion of the discussion when we're talking to men about the benefit of an intervention for their prostate cancer. We, don't, we talk about oncological benefit and then um, uh, on the other hand, uh, risk of side effects. So and the PROTECT trial, actually in the same, um, in a parallel paper, um, reported patient uh, out, reported outcomes for quality of life among um, 1,600 men who completed questionnaires that um, looked at validated measures of urinary bowel sexual function, quality of life, and some other parameters. And they published their six-year data, um, and they analyzed uh, their uh, quality of life outcomes based on an attention to treat analysis. And this table shows um, the different um, uh, sort of validated questionnaires that were used to assess urinary function, sexual function, bowel function, and health-related quality of life. They showed that prostatectomy had uh, the greatest negative effect on urinary incontinence as demonstrated in the, um, the red box at the top of the screen with higher um, bother scores um, for incontinence and greater pad use. There was some recovery, but um, incontinence remained worse for prostatectomy in patients over time. For radiation therapy, voiding in nocturia was worse than the other arms at six months, but it mostly recovered and it was similar after a year. For active monitoring patients, sort of hard to see here, it's the blue checked line. Um, there was a gradual deterioration of urinary function uh, over time related to both aging and the fact that many of these men converted to treatment over time. So in terms of sexual function, um, prostatectomy had the greatest negative effect on sexual function. Sort of the red line here, you can see the, the, the lowest uh, um, scores for erection firmness and sexual function. Um, the, the score has improved after six months, but, but you know, the function, sexual function remained worse for surgery patients compared to the other arms continually over time. For radiation therapy, the negative effect on sexual function was greatest at six months, but this recovered somewhat and was stable thereafter. Uh, similar to um, continence, um, men um, in active monitoring had a gradual decline in their sexual function. Radiotherapy, what did demonstrate worsened uh, bowel um, um, function, um, at six months, and uh, while that recovered somewhat, there was some persistence of, of bloody stools and uh, bowel morbidity um, thereafter. So this, this shows that um, despite some of these differences between treatments in, um, in terms of sexual bowel and urinary function, there, was, there were actually no significant differences between arms in measures of anxiety, depression, or uh, health-related quality of life. So this study shows that you know, clearly there are different side effect profiles for different approaches with prostatectomy doing worse for incontinence and, and potency, radiotherapy doing worse for bowel function, though there were similar urinary function quality of life and health related quality of life overall. And uh, there was a gradual deterioration for monitored patients. I think it's important sort of to think um, that this was a randomized trial. And in real life, we don't really randomize men to one treatment versus another. It's a way of trying to minimize bias in assessing outcomes. But you know, in real life, we select treatments based on both men's preferences and their baseline risk factors. And we guide men toward what we think may be better therapies for them to minimize morbidity based on urinary function, et cetera. I think it's important to um, you know, uh, acknowledge that surgery patients do worse with continence and erectile dysfunction. Um, we expect that with continence to some extent, but um, we, we often talk about uh, comparability with erectile function, and I think it's sobering to see that um, you know, over time with validated questionnaires, the surgical patients do do a bit worse than the radiation therapy patients. Um, I think it's also sobering to see that in this study, there was a pattern greater use among up to 20% of men uh, over the course of, of five years or more. Um, you know, we, we certainly um, work very hard to, to help men recover their continence after surgery, but the fact remains that a significant subset of men will continue to use pads. I think it's also important to point out that there's a, a pretty high rate of baseline ED in men who uh, undergo treatment for prostate cancer. I didn't show it earlier, but about a third of men had a ba baseline inability to penetrate. So we really need to, uh, this, this underscores the importance of evaluating baseline function in men who are being treated for their prostate cancer or considering treatment so that we can manage expectations and know where we're starting from.
So this was a follow. This was um, the protect follow up. This was sort of an analysis based on treatment received rather than intention to treat. I won't belabor the point here, but um, this sort of parallels the update of the on oncological outcomes, and it really just shows um, that in, 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 a, in an analysis by treatment received, um, there was there were similar functional outcomes where men who underwent surgery had greater pad use, worse erectile function, and men who uh, underwent radiation therapy had worse nocturia and worse um, uh, increased risk of bloody stools. This is just for completeness. This is from the PIVOT trial. It shows it, these curves compare um, uh, continence and potency for men undergoing surgery versus watchful waiting. And not surprisingly, there's a greater risk of incontinence and impotence among men who are treated versus observed. And this is uh, the same for SPCG4, showing greater risk of, of urinary and erectile dis morbidity and erectile dysfunction among, treat among treated patients versus observed patients. This is the last quality of life study to mention, but this, this came from SPCG4, and I think is important just to discuss briefly. So a significant proportion of men in SPCG4 ended up needing androgen deprivation therapy. So these, these authors asked the question, how does ADT, uh, with or without other treatments, affect quality of life among both men assigned to watchful waiting, pursuing watchful waiting, and assigned to surgery? So they sent a questionnaire to all of the men who were randomized in the SPCG4 trial who were still alive, which was 400 of the men, as well as a control group of 281 men. They, um, there was a median of 12 year follow up and the, the median age was 77. And uh, among the men in that trial, 26% in the surgery group ultimately received ADT versus 40% in the watchful waiting arm. And this table shows that um, men who received ADT, not surprisingly, had lower quality of life uh, compared to men who did not receive ADT, uh, but that for the men who had watchful waiting and, and ultimately needed ADT, they really had the lowest scores for quality of life uh, and other, other sort of measures uh, that are, are listed here. I think it's worth also showing that men who had watchful waiting had a similar quality of life to control men who didn't even have prostate cancer, uh, which goes to the conclusion that, you know, um, that Perhaps one can live with untreated prostate cancer and maintain the same quality of life as a background population, which I think is important to show. I think it's important here to show, too, that the men who had watchful waiting and needed ADT actually had the lowest scores for all psychological uh, parameters, and they actually did scored worse than men who had surgery and then required ADT. And the authors here postulate that maybe you know, men who had surgery um, had some greater sense of agency in treating their disease and were less bothered by the need for ADT versus the men who um, started out with watchful waiting. This is really just, just more for thought than anything else. So one of the points of this is to sort of give a background for you know, being evidence-based in your counseling of men who have newly diagnosed prostate cancer. I think it's important to acknowledge that we don't need just level one evidence to help counsel men and, and those trials can um, you know, sort of have, have, have historical limitations. We can also look at active surveillance cohorts and other um, sort of prospective large registries that assess side, of, assess side effects of treatment to help um, us learn and understand how men experience these, these treatments. And then we can counsel them on observational approaches versus treatment approaches a bit better. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown that RCTs can be useful to understand the effects of treatment on localized prostate cancer for both survival and quality of life. I think it's important to know how the, the strengths and limitations, to know the strengths and limitations of these studies, maybe think how your patient may fit into the trial data. It's also important to acknowledge that these, these studies really don't look at um, subsets of men with um, additional risk factors like family history and African American descent and, and the generalizability in that regard may be limited. These studies do show that radical treatment um, for localized disease can reduce the risk of advanced disease and metastasis and perhaps some mortality and perhaps reduce mortality for a subset of patients with the trade-off in quality of life. Though the absolute benefit will depend on baseline risk, lead time, and competing risks. As mentioned several times here, screening, biopsy, and treatment approaches have changed over time. Um, and while you know, um, in the current era, we do treat patients differently from how men were treated in these trials, we shouldn't be nihilistic and we should really um, try to glean lessons from these very rigorous longitudinal trials. Another important point is that surgery and radiation have, are shown in predicting, particularly in PROTECT, but also in we, the way we think about it presently, they're, they're similar in, in their effectiveness 
and individual individualizing counseling for men with newly diagnosed cancer with a shared decision-making approach is very important. We need to appreciate men's preferences. We need to examine risk factors for worse functional outcomes and counsel men accordingly. Multidisciplinary counseling of, of newly diagnosed men is important to ensure men hear different perspectives. We've talked a lot about here about risk reduction, you know, risks of side effects, and all of it is statistics and percentage reductions, relative risks, absolute risks. And there's a challenge in, in terms of sharing these, 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 this data with patients because of, of the challenge of low numeracy. And even providers, frankly, have difficulties processing these statistical concepts and trying to apply risk reduction to an individual versus a population. We also have the challenge of an apples to oranges comparison. So, you know, we talk to men about the, the risk of metastasis or death, and we, we, we weigh that against risk of incontinence and erectile dysfunction. And these are very challenging comparisons to make. And it, in a way, it's unfair to, to force men, or not force them, but put them in a position to have to make these decisions doesn't mean that we, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't engage these discussions and try to weigh these things, but I think it's important to appreciate the challenge of this really for all parties who are involved. I think we need to be candid about the side effects of treatment. Sometimes we're sort of, sort of facile about, oh, you know, you, you know you're going to be fine. Your incontinence will go away. You know, you're a young man. We're doing nurse bearing surgery. You're going to be fine. The fact is that men do have morbidity from these interventions, and we really need to be um, sort of data-driven and more objective in how we counsel men and not flip in how we do so. And ultimately, I just think it's important to show patients and providers and primary care providers or referring physicians that we're thoughtful and we're doing our best to be evidence-based in how we counsel uh, men. And that's it. Thank you. Dr. Himes, thank you so much um, for that you know, comprehensive review of these clinical trials um, for localized disease. There were um, a couple questions. The first um, one that I wanted to ask regarding, I don't, this is kind of a very pointed question, but the SPCG trial, you showed that um, for those individuals with positive margins, there is no difference in absolute, um, no difference in absolute reduction of uh, mortality risk. Uh, is there any chance that there's a difference in, adjuvant therapy between those two. There was a difference with extra capsular margin involvement, but nothing with positive margins. Um, was there varying rates of adjuvant, like ADT, between those two? Yeah, so they, they were, in none of the um, sort of published reports from that trial did they um, sort of give specifics on the number of men um, who that I saw, it may have been an appendices of, you know, the number of men who had some adjuvant or salvage therapy. So I, I really can't answer that question. Um, you know, whether, you know, typically men who have, um, you know, adjuvant therapy have more than one risk factor for recurrence. So they'll have positive margins and EPE or a higher Gleason and, or a higher Gleason score. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's it's hard for me to answer that question. I I really just don't know. Yeah. Um. The the other the last question Dr. Sam Ali had for you. It's a little. Um. He kind. Of, I think he's trying to see what your preference is with the new data that's coming out about multiparametric MRI. How do you counsel patients on MRI use for uh, those who have elevated PSAs on active surveillance? Yeah. So you know I think MRI is a, a really important part of active surveillance. Um, you know, typically we do MRIs before an initial biopsy now. Um, and so, there, so there's a baseline for, for uh, MRI. Um, and, you know, for men who have a higher PIRAD score, have a biopsy and there's low risk disease and they up for surveillance, um, we'll typically do a, you know, a repeat biopsy, you know, within a year um, with a repeat MRI. There's some evidence that progression of a lesion on MRI um, uh, correlates with, with histological pr progression. Um, though. Uh, there's not really great data for that. So uh, certainly if you see a change in your MRI over time, that can suggest that, that you know, something adverse is occurring in the prostate. Um, you know, for men who have a higher pyrite score, like a pyrite four or five, and then have a biopsy showing only Gleason 6 disease, um, I typically have greater concern for undersampling and then will repeat an MRI and a biopsy earlier within um, six months rather than waiting a year um, to ensure that we didn't miss anything significant. Um, but I think MRI is a really important part of active surveillance. And, you know, the trials that we went through really um, compared watchful waiting and active monitoring, uh, which are much looser than active surveillance uh, to treatment. 
And so that's certainly, um, I think, I think it's, it's likely that active surveillance is, is going to be safer and reduce the risk of some of these, so perhaps risk of metastasis or clinical progression compared to, you know, the sort of historical watchful waiting approach. But, but that really hasn't been demonstrated yet. We do have, as I mentioned in that latter slide, active surveillance cohort showing a very low risk of metastasis over time and men who are followed, who are selected for surveillance, um, some of whom have MRI, some of whom haven't. But um, I think you have to look at all of that to, to help you counsel men. But I think MRI is a really important element of active surveillance. Great. Well, thank you. There's also comments about how wonderful your slides were. And I think people would love if, you, if you're if you up for sharing, um, we could post the slides as well.